Hello everyone, I am the Magic Kirby, and welcome to my channel, The Commander Tavern. The Commander Tavern is a channel dedicated to my favorite Magic Gathering format. Commander Cube Draft is a new mini-series where I'm going to be talking about everything Cube Draft, but related specifically to the Commander format. Throughout this series, I'm going to be explaining the process behind how I brewed my own Commander Cube, as well as pointers on how to build your own. I'll also be reviewing and analyzing many topics and aspects when it comes to building your own cube. So in preparation for Commander Legends, the first Commander product designed to be drafted, I decided to begin this mini-series that will hopefully come to a conclusion after my Commander Legends episode of a flight after this set gets entirely spoiled. If you like any of the cards I'll be mentioning throughout the video, please consider using my TCG Player affiliate link when purchasing those cards. You can find that link down in the description. It'll really help out the channel. The best way you can help support the channel is by Patreon. For just $1, patrons get early access to scheduled videos on YouTube and higher tier patrons get access to the VIP section of my Discord server as well. You can find a link to both down in the description too. In fact, patrons got a chance to see this video earlier. Alright, let's get back to the episode. Since this mini-series is meant to show different aspects of drafting a commander cube, if you want to know what a cube is and how it pertains to commander, I suggest you watch the first episode which you can find in the link above. In it, I explain what a cube is, how the deck building process occurs when constructing legit commander decks from a drafted pool of cards is, and, as will be discussed in great detail in today's episode, cards you drafted but didn't include in your deck will by default become your sideboard. Just to review quickly, when you draft for a commander, you have to do so under the assumption that you're building a commander deck. That means that you have to select a commander or partner commanders, and then build a singleton deck with exceptions, complying with the color identity of your commander. These cards, along with your commander, make your 100 card deck. However, even if you're drafting for certain colors because maybe you already have a strong idea of which commander or potential commanders you want to build, you might still end up with off-colored cards. For example, let's say you drafted enough cards to build a solid black-red-green reanimator deck, but during the draft you had no choice but to pick some white or blue cards. That's not a problem because all cards drafted go to your draft pool. It's from your draft pool that you build your deck. So if you do decide on building that black, red, green reanimator deck, all those cards with white and or blue, along with any on-color cards you didn't include in your deck, would then constitute your sideboard. And here's where I'm dedicating this episode. Building a commander deck is hard enough as it is due to color identity restrictions. Also, per the normal constructed commander rules, there is no sideboard in the commander format. However, when drafting, you are inevitably going to be left over with a sideboard. This means that you can potentially play off-colored cards you drafted that you really wanted to play with by technically including them in your deck via wish effects. In my own commander cube, I included as many wish effects as I could precisely for that very reason. Those wish cards are a way to bend the color identity rules and allow players to play with cards they were forced to pick or wanted to pick because they either already picked a wish effect or risked taking the chance to pick a wish effect later. For example, the first game of the second season of the stage was one that resulted from drafting my commander cube. You can find it in the link above. So spoiler alert if you haven't seen it yet. In that game, I was playing a Moto the Gnarled Article Thievery deck. However, after picking most of my potential commanders to be within that color identity in order to have as many on-color and useful cards in my deck as possible, when I open the second pack, I find Nerf 4 in it. I've been wanting to be able to play with this card for a very long time, so I choose it as my first pick, completely ignoring any of the cards in that pack that were way better for the strategy I was amassing. This was obviously a bad move, but it was a game just for fun, so I figured, why not? I did have a backup plan though since I did draft Sisei with a light captain just in case so I figured that if I didn't draft any wish effects that I would build around Sisei if I really wanted to cast Nerf War that game. Fortunately for me, throughout the draft I was past a cunning wish and eventually a research and development. Thanks to those picks, I was able to risk it and stick to my original idea of a black-green-blue thievery deck with Moro and just include Cunning Wish. Having Cunning Wish in my deck meant that I could use it to wish for research and development to then use the research half to pick 4 cards from my sideboard and shuffle them into my deck. Obviously, one of those 4 cards I chose was Nerf War, which I was also fortunate enough to be able to cast in that game. Granted, I had to jump through some other hoops to get it like tutoring and drawing through my deck, but I had the satisfaction of playing Nerf War in a commander game. So how was I able to do this? You might say, but Kirby, wish effects don't work in commander, and you'd be right. However, they don't work as intended because in constructed commander, you don't have a sideboard, but in a draft, you do have a sideboard, which is comprised of the cards you drafted that you didn't include to construct your deck, which is what I explained earlier. So this is where wish effects come in. In order to run a card with a wish effect in your deck, it has to follow the deck building rules, meaning it has to follow your commander's color identity. However, when you resolve that wish effect, as long as you have a card in your sideboard you can target, you do so, regardless of color identity, since it's inevitable for your sideboard to have off-colored cards. This can have plenty of benefits in your commander cube. For one thing, it helps players when building their deck since it gives them the opportunity to play with cards from their sideboard if they weren't allowed to include them in their deck due to color identity restrictions. 
Another thing which affects Let's Players do is essentially tutor for cards in their sideboard without having to include those cards in their library, essentially allowing them to seemingly have a deck that is larger than 100 cards since you're also playing with cards from your sideboard. Keep in mind though that you also can't run lands that break color identity. So if you want to be able to perform these hijinxes and shenanigans, you have to run lands, mana rocks, or mana dorks that can tap for any color of mana. Otherwise, you might not be able to even play that card that you wish for. So let's go over all the wish effects printed so far as of the recording of the video and how I've personally classified them by. First off, we have the classic wish effects which simply allow you to get a card from your sideboard and put it into your hand. Granted, in non-section games, these can be from anywhere in your collection, but for a cube draft environment, we will limit ourselves to the sideboard. In any case, let's analyze them one at a time. Burning Wish is only restricted to wishing for a sorcery in our sideboard. This might be useful for spell slinging decks that have red in their color identity, but maybe drafted a bomb of a sorcery that they couldn't run in their deck. Same with Cunning Wish. This one is restricted to instants though. So maybe you built a spell slinging deck but couldn't run a particular instant you drafted. Or maybe you have really good responses in your sideboard but didn't have the space for them. Cunning Wish thus becomes a modal instant where you can try and cast any of those other instants in your sideboard for just 3 additional mana. Golden Wish is a little better and thus why it costs so much more. The reason it's better than the previous two is because even though it's restricted to what you can wish for, you can wish for either an artifact or an enchantment which is twice as many possible card types as the previous two. Living Wish is similar in that it can be used to wish for a creature or a land, however it costs way less. I've seen this primarily used to wish for off-colored creatures but I've also seen it be used to get an off-colored land that was drafted in a pinch when the person was behind on lands, so it's a great wish as well. Glittering Wish only costs 2 mana to cast but it is an amazing wish spell as well. Although it's not limited to card types, it is limited to colors, so as long as the card you're wishing for is multicolored, Glittering Wish will get it for you. In my cube in particular, this is an amazing wish since potential commanders are drafted first. So if there was a multicolored legendary creature that you didn't use, either as your commander or one of the 99, then you can include it indirectly thanks to Glittering Wish. Now, of the literal wishes, Death Wish is potentially the best one since it's not limited to anything. It's basically a tutor that accesses your sideboard for any card. Naturally, this brings about a huge downside which is half of your life. Now, that might be a bad thing, but if your deck is also synergistic with life loss, Death Wish can also actually be an amazing card in your deck on top of what it does. Fast forward a couple of years and Mastermind's Acquisition gets printed, which is a much better Death Wish, so the power creep is definitely real. Mastermind's Acquisition is possibly the best tutor in my cube as well as Wish Effect since it can get you pretty much any card in your draft pool, whether you included it in your deck or not. Now, rewind quite a lot of years to Magic's first expansion and you can find Ring of Maruf. This wish effect is a bit pricey since it costs 5 mana to cast, then costing 5 mana tapping and exiling itself to activate. So this is better suited for future turns after casting. That being said, it's similar to Death Wish in that it can get you any card from your sideboard regardless of what it is. It also exiles itself as part of the effect. Rig of Maruf is also pricey in terms of secondary market value since it's a reserve list card from Arabian Nights. As of the recording of this video, it can cost anywhere from $90 and up. At least I've seen lightly to heavily played versions for about $40 to $60. That being said, as far as wish effects goes, it's definitely the most useful one since it can go in any deck made because it's colorless and it can wish for any card in your sideboard without restriction. But unless you already have a copy, I wouldn't spend so much on one unless budget isn't really an issue for your queue. Coax from the Blind Eternities is the final one of these wish effects that put a card from your sideboard into your hand. Unfortunately, this one is incredibly niche since it can only wish for an Eldrazi. Granted, it can also get an Exiled Eldrazi, but I don't run it in my queue because I don't have any tribal support for any creature type whatsoever in it. Tribal is the hardest archetype to support in a commander cube without having to include any house rules when it comes to drafting or having to dedicate so much of your cube to it. So I didn't use a slot in it for my cube. That being said, if Eldrazi are a supported tribe in your cube, then you can definitely add this one. Even then, Legion Angel is the most restricted wish effect as of the recording of this video. It only lets you wish for another card named Legion Angel in your sideboard. However, chances are that, like me, you've either built or are building a singleton cube, which tends to be the norm. If that's the case, then the angel is pretty useless apart from being a 4-3 flyer for 4 mana. One more wish effect in this section is Research and Development. The research half of this spell lets you choose up to 4 cards from your sideboard for only 2 mana and at instant speed. The downside, they don't go to your hand, they get shuffled into your library. That's still an amazing trade-off, especially since you can cast this at the end of the turn before yours. This essentially allows you to potentially add 4 off-color cards into your deck. Again, you're going to need on-color ways to generate any color mana in order to use them, but the fact remains that you're now able to play them whenever you tutor for them or draw into them. 
Wisened Arbiter might seem like an odd choice for a deck since when it enters the battlefield it swaps a card in your hand for a white card in your sideboard. Surely if you're running Wisened Arbiter in your deck, then you can play white spells, right? Well, maybe you have a green-white commander but wanted to include a white-black spell in your deck. Having the Arbiter enter the battlefield means that you can trade a card in your hand for that white-black spell in your sideboard. This can be quite useful in a blinking deck since you can get way more value from it. It remains to be seen if Painter Servant combos with Wizened Arbiter in order to let you get any card from your graveyard if you choose white. Arcane Savant is a pretty busted wish effect that actually works before you even start the game. Before you shuffle your deck, you reveal it and then you exile an instant or sorcery that you drafted but didn't put in your deck. In other words, your sideboard. The reason it's busted is because you can cast a copy of that spell for free whenever it enters the battlefield. So not only can you exile an instant or sorcery spell outside of your commander's color identity, but you can cast it for free, bypassing having to generate the mana to be able to cast it anyways. So any bomb you drafted that's outside of your colors, or even in your colors, can be cast for free when it enters the battlefield. Include it in a blinking deck for even more debauchery. The final wish effect in this section is Command the Shaft. Similarly to Arcane Savant, this allows you to cast a non-land spell for free. However, the curious thing about this wish effect is that it actually seeks out a spell in an opponent's sideboard. So it's a way to steal a spell from an opponent, but not from their hand, graveyard, library, or any other zone. Next, I'm going to analyze what I consider to be reusable or recurrable wish effects. For example, sending Fey of Wishes on an adventure is also a wish effect costing as much as Mastermind's Acquisition, but it's limited to non-creature cards, which is still amazing. You can then cast it from Exile as a 1-4 flyer for 2 mana that functions as both a discard outlet and way to bounce itself. This means that Fey of Wishes provides a reusable wish effect. Technically, the other wishes are reusable if you're able to recover them from the graveyard or from Exile, but Fey of Wishes has a built-in way to reuse its effect, thus allowing you to essentially use your sideboard almost like a second hand. This is definitely one of the best wish effects in the cube for this very reason. Karn the Great Creator is another reusable wish effect. In this case, Karn can get you artifacts from your sideboard. Whether you use this effect to get off-color artifacts or in order to keep a lot of artifacts in your sideboard and not have them take up space in your deck, it's a nice effect. Karn is also a good card per se since he has some decent abilities. Vivian Arkbor Wanger is another planeswalker with a reusable wish effect. Unfortunately, she can't be used as often as Karn's. That being said, you can still get the effect relatively quickly, getting you access to any creature in your sideboard. With her other abilities, Vivian is also a decent enough planeswalker in a cube besides just including her for her wish effect. Spike Tournament Grinder is pretty busted as far as wishes go in the sense that you can repeatedly use the effect and potentially for no mana. The only downside is that Spike can only wish for cards that have been banned or restricted in a constructed format. Fortunately, if you go to its entry in Scryfall and click here, this will let you know exactly which cards Spike can wish for. So if you have a lot of those cards in your cube, then Spike is a great addition. In my cube, there are almost 70 cards Spike can wish for, so it has the potential to get a couple of them if you draft them. Nightmare Moon is another silver-boarded mono-black legendary creature with a conditional wish effect. Whenever any player helps in activating her ability to transform into Princess Luna, you choose up to 6 cards you own from your sideboard that have a moon in its art and exile them, thus adding them to the current game. This is a pretty common silver-boarded mechanic where the art matters. If you're picky with the versions of cards you include in your cube, then there are over 600 possible cards where the art has a moon in it. You can even allow players who helped pay for the effect to play any of those cards from your exile. Sponsai of Ulamog is another tribal-dependent wish effect that is only really good in tribal-centric commander cubes. That being said, it's a good card on its own since it can create Eldrazi spawn tokens. However, if you're generating 20 mana to activate its ability, you should be winning anyways. But it is possible to just leave all of your drafted Eldrazi in your sideboard and then use this to cast them all at once. Seek Bullets' Citadel is an interesting sorcery in that its result is random. You can get unlucky and get a detrimental emblem or any of the other useful results ranging from adding pools of becoming to the current game that you can't planeswalk away from to getting a busted emblem that allows you to cast non-land spells from your sideboard. Granted, you have a 1 in 6 chance to get that effect when casting this spell, but if you do get the emblem, then your sideboard is essentially an extension of your hand that's almost impossible to interact with. Collector Protector is another interesting wish effect. I see Collector Protector as more of a political card than anything. Maybe you have a response in your sideboard that you drafted but didn't include in your deck, and there's a problem on the battlefield that needs solving. Maybe you can team up with an opponent to get rid of it. You can activate Collector Protector to give them the card in your sideboard in order for them to cast it and deal with it. Then, once it resolves, it goes to your graveyard since you own the card. Well, own in the figurative sense of the word, since you were the one who drafted it. You can also include it in a group hug deck since you can literally give opponents cards from your draft shaft in your sideboard. In effect, there's plenty of ways to use this card. 
Frontier Explorer and Sovereign's Realm are both reusable wish effects that let you play basic lands from outside of the game, with the Cat Scout limited only to basic planes. In this case, since you don't put basic lands into your sideboard, these basic lands are supposed to come from the unlimited supply of basic lands that are provided to players when building their decks from what they drafted in a draft. I love Frontier Explorer as a way to never miss a land drop in white decks. Caller of the Untamed is similar to the previously mentioned Arcane Savant, only this time you exile a creature you drafted that you didn't include in your deck, again at the beginning of the game before you even start it. Then you can pay X and tap it to create a creature token that's a copy of that creature. Although you're creating a copy of this creature, you're technically able to play with that creature in your sideboard that you didn't include in your deck. Whether you do this to take advantage of a token deck or just to be able to play an off-color creature you couldn't include in your deck is up to you. Baltal Chimera does something similar, but this time you exile three or more creatures that you drafted but didn't include in your deck, i.e. your sideboard. Then, for just two mana, it becomes a copy of any of those exiled creatures chosen at random. This is another great way to be able to play with those off-colored creatures you drafted, or as a cheap way to use any fatties you drafted since the Chimera will become a copy of any of them for just two mana. Decorated Knight is technically a reusable wish effect, only that its adventure ability doesn't wish for any particular card, it wishes for an entire deck obviously a commander deck since we're playing a commander game. However, when it attacks, it triggers its second wish effect which is drawing a card from your original deck. Since a cube is meant to be drafted and then decks built from the pool of drafted cards, this seems pretty busted since not only will you be able to swap your drafted deck for any of your constructed decks, making your game much more consistent than the rest of the table, but attacking with the knight will let you draw a card from your drafted deck. However, if we consider outside of the game to mean your sideboard, then its adventure ability and attacking ability don't really work as intended. That being said, I love its possible interaction with better than one. When you cast it, you can choose someone outside of the game to be your teammate. What you do is give them everything you have, your entire library, all of your permanents, and all the cards in your hand. But what you do is, while better than one is on the stack, tap enough mana to be able to cast Decorated Knight for its adventure cost and have it be the only card left in your hand. Once you get a new teammate, send Decorated Knight on an adventure and now you get one of your decks to play with while your teammate is already set up in the game. This can be super fun. Another type of wish effect is wishing for literal booster packs. Of these, there are only three as of the recording of this video. Booster Tutor, Summon the Pact, and Stalking Tiger. Now, there are various ways you can use these effects. One is to keep actual sealed boosters at hand for when someone uses these effects. That way you can crack the booster as instructed by the card. Or, you can take a booster from your cube as when you drafted it. This is how I use these cards at least. Since my cube is drafted in three parts, the boosters made for these effects are 20 card quote unquote packs taken from the second section of my cube. But you can use them as you see fit for your cube. The final section of wish effects are cards that refer to themselves, in other words, the infamous companions. So far, the companion mechanic has only been printed in Ikoria and due to the massive backlash, the mechanic was errated, instead of simply banning the few of them responsible, but that's a conversation for another day. I already go over in great detail each of these companions in my Ikoria episode of A Flight which you can find in the link above. Keep in mind that even if these companions are in your sideboard because you purposefully drafted them or not, Per the mechanics rules, you can only choose one of them as your companion and you still have to comply with the deck building restrictions, not just of the companion but the deck as well. Meaning that you cannot have an off-colored companion for your deck since it's essentially your 101st card, so the companion you choose at the beginning of the game would be the only special card in your sideboard that can wish itself into your hand per the rules of the companion mechanic. The final cards I want to mention are cards that can't really be categorized. Cardboard Carapace refers to other copies of Cardboard Carapace you own outside of the game, which in this case refers to your sideboard if you're drafting. If you want to take it literally though, then you'd have to have as many copies of Cardboard Carapace in your personal collection as you feel necessary to make this card as busted as possible. As of the recording of this video, its price is $1.58. So if you buy 101 of them, excluding any taxes and shipping fees, will set you back about $159.58. It might seem like a lot, but that means that you'd have a 6 CMC aura in your cube that can give enchanted creature plus 100 plus 100, which I'm pretty sure is pretty broken. This takes pay to win to a whole other level. Jester's Sombrero is the last card in the video and I mention it because it directly deals with sidewards. I had joked that the only reason the companion mechanic was so rampant in other formats was because the Sombrero is a silver bordered card and thus not legal in those formats. 
That being said, I feel like this card is too niche for a cube since what it does is deprive an opponent of 3 cards from their sideboard. So unless your cube is small enough where companions or other wish effects shenanigans are going to be commonplace, this card might actually be a good way to neutralize opponent's wish effects. You can activate it in response to a wish effect and remove it from the game with what they were trying to wish for. But again, this is a very niche effect. Hopefully this video was helpful in showcasing how to use wish effects in your commander cube as well as which would be a good fit for it. As for my own cube, I own most of these wish effects except for only a couple of them. If you hadn't already and want to take a gander at the current version of my commander cube, you can find links to it in the description. I have way more topics to cover in greater detail and depth for this mini series so stay tuned. I would like to thank all my patrons for supporting me and a quick shout out to all my higher tier patrons the Brewers for their patronage. I also want to thank everyone using my TCG player affiliate link. And to everyone, thanks for watching this episode of Commander Cube Draft on the Commander Tavern. I am Demented Kirby and happy drafting.